Hey guys, welcome back to Ostrich Investing, where our goal is to educate and debate specific stock investment ideas. Go ahead and subscribe to this channel, and I guarantee all of your wildest investment dreams might come true. Let that sink in. Today we are going straight to the top of the Brookfield food chain. We are going to be talking about Brookfield Asset Management. A few, have requested, a few of you have requested this video, so thank you for that. And there's no wonder why, because it's been one of Canada's most successful investment stories over the last few years. Um, BAM, for those of you who don't know, is the parent company of the Brookfield Empire, has listed subsidiaries in real estate, renewable power, infrastructure, and private equity. It's led by Bruce Flatt, and the management team has an excellent track record of creating shareholder value. As you can see here on the quick overview, we've got operations across many parts of the world, 100,000 employees, 500 billion of assets under management, 200 billion plus of which is fee bearing, uh, and they've got over 1,800 institutional investors invested in their funds. And if we just move forward here, if you look at the share price, uh, BAM shares reached a low way back, uh, we don't even show it here, we're just showing the last five years. But back in, in 2009, they were trading at $10 a share, and they, they're up 600% since then, closing just on Friday at $71.45. And that share price is up 27% just over the last year alone. So if you just look back to about this period here, they've had a good run. Um, they're currently trading at 20 times operating funds from operations over the last 12 months. So this video is going to take a look at BAM to see if it's overvalued at $70 a share or if it still re represents an interesting investment opportunity uh, for investors. Let's jump in. So we've got a few discussion points that we want to run through. I think the first of which we're going to talk about the structure and the governance. So as we mentioned at the outset, the parent company is BAM and they have several listed subsidiaries and funds beneath them. And so this is the best uh, graphic I was able to find. And you can see um, that they've got various interests. So on the property side, they've got a 51% share of BPY. They've also got many real estate funds. On the renewable power side, they've got a 61% interest in BEP. Um, and infrastructure, they've got a 30% interest in BIP. They've also got um, several infrastructure and related funds. And then on the private equity side, they've got a 63% interest in BBU, as well as several private equity funds. So what does all that mean? If you own shares in BAM, not only do you benefit uh, by the investment that they have to actually own a share of the underlying assets, but you also benefit from the fees that they generate by managing uh, these assets on behalf of their investors. So right now it's about 1.1 billion in annualized fee income and another 1.2 in, in what management calls their net target carried interest. So assuming their realized IRRs come in roughly where they'd expect them to be, that's roughly um, the carried interest that they'd be generating right now. So that's a quick snapshot of the, the business model and structure. Uh, the next point I want to talk about is governance, and uh, here you've got a dual-class voting structure with A and B shares, so if you're buying uh, shares in BAM, you're going to end up owning the A shares, which are publicly traded, both on the NYSE and the TSX. There's also B shares, which are privately held, and they're held by the management of Brookfield. And ultimately, any shareholder resolution needs to be approved by both classes of shares, voting independently as a class. So what that means is um, the class B's don't control everything, but they would be able to veto um, any resolutions coming up. So you need both classes of shares to vote together um, to get things through. From a board perspective, I believe there's 16 directors, eight of which which are elected by the class A shares, which would be the public, and then the other eight elected by the class B shares. Um, so just important to know as an investor what the governance situation is um, and know going in uh, that there's a dual class share structure here. Next thing, if we just get to the next slide here, 
got a couple of other key discussion points. The first one will be the financials. And uh, there are a lot of numbers on the slide here, and I don't expect you to be able to read them. The point um, that I'm trying to make is there's so much going on, as you saw in the structure, with all of the entities that they own and control, assets that they manage. They're constantly buying and disposing of assets. That looking at the cash flow statement, income statement, balance sheet, it, there's a lot going on, and it's really tricky to um, to understand exactly um, what's going on or to, to see the story. So if you can see here just on the financing activities alone, just a few examples. So they arranged $43 billion in non-recourse borrowings. Uh, they also repaid $28 billion. They've got some credit facilities of $3 billion coming in. Uh, they've got some subsidiary equity obligations. There's capital provided from non-controlling interests capital repaid to non-controlling interest. So to be able to go through and sift through these financial statements would be, is really tricky. And ultimately what it means, their corporate structure and moving pieces, they make the financial st statements difficult to analyze and you, you need to be able to trust management. And I would say that so far, Brookfield Management has done a great job at uh, building and maintaining that investor confidence and trust uh, and they've delivered against their expectations and you'll see on the next few slides that they have a lot of supplemental disclosure, which really helps investors make sense of what's going on here. But I did think it was important just to point out that go in, take a look at the financial statements as presented. It is a tricky story to understand from the account prepared financials. So if we get into the supplement, supplemental disclosure, um, we're going to walk through a few things here really just want to highlight some of the key areas that they talk about. They typically focus on the capital growth, which is going to drive fee income, and then cash flow. And they look at cash flow really in, in two separate ways. More and more we see them looking at this cash available for distribu distribution. We'll talk about that in a second. But here you can see this is from their Q2 supplemental disclosure. You can see fee bearing capital. So, so this is this is the capital where they're actually able to charge fees for, for managing broken down by private funds listed partnerships and public securities as you can see that's at 164 billion as at their investor day uh, from uh, just a couple days ago this was up over 200 billion over on the right here funds from operations and net income so ffo they're just walking you through uh, how they get there. It's $4.56 per share if you take out the realized uh, disposition gains. That's where you get to that normalized uh, free funds from operations that we talked about at the outset. And then lastly, uh, just over here on the left, this chart, cash available for distribution. That's something they're starting to talk about a lot more in their investor day and in their supplemental disclosure. And, and really what this is, is um, adding up your their fee income as well as any distributions that they get um, from their subsidiaries. So instead of looking at it from a, a cash flow or generated, it's, it's at the business level, Brookfield's starting to think about this in terms of just the cash that they have coming in. So think about the dividends that get paid out on BPY stock or... Um, uh, the renewable subsidiary. All of those distributions, because they own, they have a percentage ownership in each, come up to the parent. And in addition to that, they've also got uh, fee income coming in from their funds as well as the listed partnerships, and they net that out against the actual like, corporate overhead. So that's what that's what this number is, and it's something that they talk a lot about in their in their most recent investor day. The other thing that they talk about in their uh, supplemental disclosure and uh, they, they build up their invested capital for you and then they actually take you to what they believe would be the right share price or value for, for their shares in the market, which, which is incredibly confident. There aren't too many management teams out there and I'll just, I'll just go ahead one more slide just so you can see it and we'll come back. There aren't too many management teams out there that tell you what they believe their stock price should be worth in writing. Uh, so it's interesting to see 
Brookfield go out and, and do that. So we'll walk through the numbers quickly. My first point is, wow, there's so many numbers. You know, in, in making this video, um, the story itself at a high level is pretty simple. It's just a very successful asset manager and operator of infrastructure related assets. And they've been able to grow cash flow because infrastructure assets have, have themselves been good places to be. Um, but in addition to that, they've just attracted a lot of new institutional capital and their, their fee bearing capital has gone up. So from a high level, it's a simple story, but when you get into the numbers, because there's so many related parties and they're so active, it's a tricky story uh, to analyze. So lots of numbers on the page. The one key thing to say here, this is really just looks at their listed subs and their ownership interest in each. And they take either the quoted value, so the, the market cap, if you just took the share price multiplied by the number of shares that they own, or the value that you'd get from an accounting perspective, IFRS basis. So I, I think it's a little bit funny. Uh, all management teams would do this, I'm sure. They use the quoted value in every case except for BPY. And as you can see here, the quoted value for BEP, BIP, and BBU is always bigger than the IFRS value. So they've, they've taken that. And for BPY, the IFRS value is significantly higher. So they've gone ahead and, and taken the IFRS value. So the blended value that they use is really the, the greater of, if we can think about it that way. And that gets you to uh, 32 billion, add in some other corporate cash and financial assets um, and make your net debt and working capital adjustments. And you've got 33 billion in net capital, uh, net invested capital. So if you, just going back to BPY, if you're all curious why the quoted value is at such a discount to IFRS, that's one of the videos I did previously several months ago was why Brookfield Properties trades at a 40% discount to NAV. And if you are interested, um, go ahead and look for that video and uh, let me know what you think. So they've got $33 billion in, in invested capital, and that's going to come through to the next slide. So the next slide, here's where they get a little bit cheeky and try and tell you what their shares are worth. You can see the invested capital here, $33 billion that we just saw on the last page. And then what they add on top of that, and, and really their, their premise, which does make sense in my opinion, is the value of a share in Brookfield Asset Management is really the value of our invested capital. So we own a share in, in these infrastructure and real estate assets, plus the value of the asset management franchise. And, and that's really where they're laying this on top here. So they're saying we've got little over a billion dollars in fee-related earnings each year. We're going to go ahead and put a multiple of 20 times on that. And that drives a value of $21 billion. For our carried interest, our run rate is almost $1.2 billion right now. And based on our target carried interest, and we're going to apply a 10 times multiple, it's not quite as consistent because it's very much performance-based. Uh, so they apply half the multiple on that, gets you to 11.6 billion. And if you build that up, you've got 35 billion roughly for the asset management franchise, plus 33 billion for uh, the value of their invested capital. And that gets you to 68 billion, and that works out to $67.58 per share. Now, very careful to point out, that's US dollars per share. And so at the top, we're, we're talking about $70 Canadian. So it's currently trading just over $70 Canadian. I believe it's about 55 US. And so you can see in management's views, view, there's still lots of room for the share price to catch up with what they view as their plan value per share. And you can see just the last on the, on the bottom right, I put a little chart here that shows over time how they've grown their, their plan value over time, currently at 68 billion. Leverage is another point that I wanted to talk about. Um, Brookfield in their investor presentations mentions how much liquidity they have and a relatively low level of, of corporate debt. 
which is true. I do want to point out to investors that there is a ton of leverage here. Um, there's $118 billion of total debt, but the majority, vast majority of it is non-recourse property specific. So you can see here $103 billion of that um, sits at the property level, no recourse to the parent entities and no recourse to them. So for Brookfield Asset Management, there's $6.4 billion of debt that sits at the parent level. So as we're putting it all together and we'll talk about key considerations in a second. Um, this is fresh from their investor day just a few days ago. As management puts all of this together, if they continue to grow and execute the way that, that they see over the next five years, um, they expect to be able to drive a plan value per share of $141. So how do they do that? Well, growing their, their capital base, growing their assets, um, continuing to generate carried interest, and of course, growing their invested capital base. So we'll walk through just a couple of the, the items in each, but in management's view, in five years, they could have a plan value of $141 per share based on their assumptions today. So if we look today, today they're generating a little over $2 billion in free cash flow. Uh, and that's $1 billion from fee-related earnings. Distributions from their investments get them another $1.7. And then you net out the corporate costs that sit at the BAM parent level. That's $2.1 billion. And you can see that down below in this chart. The $2.1 billion, this is that cash available for distribution that they are uh, starting to talk about a lot. They see this growing to $5 billion out in 2024 and six billion if you include the carried interest, okay? And then, again, we looked at how they come up with their plan value before, but they're essentially just moving forward, and in five years, they expect to be generating 2.5 billion in fee-related earnings, generated carried interest of 2.7 billion, put these same multiples on it, Invested capital goes up from a little over 30 billion today to 75. They've got leverage assumption. And if you add those up, you've got 149 billion in plan value per share. That's $141 per share. And as they get out five years and are generating 5 billion plus in, in cash flow or cash available for distribution, one of the key things that, they, that they're talking about is being able to increase the dividend level to BAM investors and or uh, buyback shares. So if everything works out, you'll see a ton of cash flow dri driven up to the parent here, and they'll have a lot of optionality with uh, what they use it for. And, and uh, what they're telling you now is increase dividends and share buybacks. Okay, so we've gone through some of the key discussion points. Um, we've seen where management sees the value in their shares today. We've also seen their assumptions out five years, uh, getting to a plan value per share of about $140. Now let's walk through some of the key considerations for an investor that would be stepping into the stock today. So on the strength side, uh, Brookfield's a global player with excellent track record, operating experience differentiates them from other financial investors. Um, over the last 10 years, their investment uh, performance has been stellar. If you look at the returns on their funds, most of them have been very strong. Uh, that's helped them attract capital. And here, you know, they've got decades of experience operating these assets, whether it's in the real estate business or the renewable power business. And that differentiates them from other financial investors that might not have that operating experience. And so if you're a financial investor, do you want to try and do this on your own? Or would you rather invest in one of BAM's um, funds? Number two, infrastructure and long life assets underpin the business operations. So this provides stable cash flows. Again, if you think about real estate on long term leases or renewable power assets under a long term power purchase agreement, most of the assets underneath um, are generating stable and growing cash flows. So it's a nice place to be. Number three, um, in, for BAM, they, they benefit from the management fees as well as their ownership interest in the underlying assets. So here's where they sort of get to have their cake and eat it too if everything's uh, working, out, working out well for them. On the risk side, uh, rising interest rates 
because of the type of assets that underpin everything here, uh, rising interest rates would um, hurt the value of those assets um, and make it, uh, in, no, there's nothing more that I have to add there. It would hurt the value of the assets that they own. I put unlikely here, uh, obviously we're in a low interest rate environment and, um, and you know, think for yourself whether you think this is a real risk at the present time or not, but it would have a material impact. Um, and not to jump too far ahead here, uh, but interest rates up or down 1% when you think about cap rates, et cetera, and these are management's numbers, uh, is about $20 a share. So very material um, in terms of the impact on, uh, on the value of the shares. Number two, increasing scale of operations and ability to deploy capital while also generating strong returns. So Brookfield has, has grown substantially over the last few years. And, and what that means is, you know, historically, if they were able to find a really good $1 billion opportunity, and I'm kind of making that number up, that might move the needle. But now as you get bigger and bigger and bigger, you need to find bigger opportunities and how many of those are out there. Um, and even if you find them, are they as good as the smaller opportunities? Um, Brookfield, and again, will tell you that they are. They're one of the few players that are positioned to execute on super large transactions. And, and I would agree with that. It's just a question of the increasing scale of operations is a bit of a risk as an investor because it's always harder to continue to move the needle the bigger you get. Number three, poor fund and investment performance. Again, this has not been the case over the last five to 10 years. It's been the opposite, uh, but as an investor, especially at the BAM level, everything ties together with the management fees and their ownership in the assets. It, it all is reliant on them putting up good, strong uh, investment performance. Number four, the success of the publicly traded subsidiaries. And again, this is almost uh, akin to number three. The fees here and the incentive structure creates a symbiotic uh, relationship with BAM. The, you know, for those entities to be successful, BAM's got to be able to find a way to continue to um, provide success for the investors in, in those entities, um, and it's got to be a win-win arrangement. And lastly, key person, you know, Bruce Flat has earned himself such a reputation. Brookfield's obviously a very large organization. We, we talked at the outset of 100,000 plus employees. Um, but I think this would be a case where you might make the argument or you might just think about um, what would happen if, if Bruce wasn't, wasn't around. Would Brookfield still be the same uh, as it is today? So with that, what are the key drivers for the stock? It's, it's AUM growth or fee-bearing capital growth. Um, that's going to drive the, the fees that they're able to charge um, and, and carried interest as well. Number two, uh, funded investment performance. And the, the, per, the performance itself is what's going to drive the carried interest on top of the dollar size. So you need increasing dollars under management, and then you need solid performance that's going to drive uh, returns as well as um, your carried interest and help you with your future fundraising. Number three, interest rates. Again, in their uh, recent investor day, they highlighted this on a slide that if interest rates fall by 1%, that would deliver an additional $20 per share to the stock. Um, and in this low interest rate environment, it, it is possible that rates um, could compress further. And what they're talking about really here is, is cap rates. So if cap rates were to compress by 1%, and that drives the valuation of their assets. But I think important to note, as an investor, that, that can go both ways too. Um, so if interest rates were to widen and, and increase, um, that could be a material uh, driver of the stock going the wrong way. Lastly, institutional allocation to alternatives. Uh, BAM in their investor day sees 25% currently allocation to alternatives, and that would be the infrastructure type assets that they uh, manage and oversee, increasing to 60% by 2030. They used to say 40, they've now bumped it up to 60% by 2030, which is, um, oh, in my mind, that's aggressive to think that the institutional allocation the majority of institutional assets are going to be allocated to alternative. Um, but if it does happen, that would add another 25 trillion um, in assets flowing into the space. So that would continue to be a driver. So in conclusion, 
betting with Brookfield has proven to be a smart play over the last 10 years. Stocks up 600%. If the company can hit its projected free cash flow targets, this stock should continue to perform well moving forward. Share buybacks and dividend growth would be expected. Key risks to the story would be rising interest rates, ability to find and acquire assets on attractive terms that move the needle, particularly as the organization gets bigger. We've got over $200 billion in fee-bearing capital currently. And lastly, can they do all that while maintaining strong levels of performance at both the fund and the public co-level, which will drive carry and incentive distributions going forward. So let me know your thoughts. I know some of you are big fans of the Brookfield story. Will it continue to deliver superior investment returns over the next five years? Or is it a lot of the upside already built in today's share price? We'll be back soon with more content. But until then, happy investing and don't bury your head in the sand.